Thank you all for joining this webinar. And I'd like to note this, that this webinar is a part of a series of webinars that we as KTMG have been hosting and running for the past three months. And the aim of these webinars is to discuss the important topics that um, we all care about and shed light about specific trends, topics, um, anything and everything we find insightful. Today, we're going to be discussing the digital transformation in the oil and gas industry. In fact, energy is a key driver of, of the world's economy, and the region and Qatar have been relying a lot on it, actually. Today, we will be discussing the various challenges the industry is facing and how being digital can help the industry overcome some of these. Given the current times, digitalization plays a very important role across the industry. And today, our today we have uh, our speakers who will be talking to us about, about this. Uh, our speakers for today will discuss the role of digitalization in the oil and gas industry. So from the Qatar team, we have Gopal, who is the head of the oil and gas. We have Nizar Hnaini, who is the head of the DI practice. We have Monica, who is a manager uh, at the DI practice as well. Uh, and from the UK, we have Mazhar Hussain, who is uh, a director in the Business Analytics uh, Institute um, at KPMG as well. So before proceeding, I would like uh, to, to keep note of a few points. Uh, your mic is on mute, and you may submit questions in the Q&A button on the right tab. We will answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A. If not, and if you're not able to answer someone, we will uh, reply via phone or email. When the webcast is over, over the webcast player will automatically refresh, re refresh the display and exit survey. Feel free to complete the survey as your comments are very valuable to us. Also, this session is being recorded and will be shared with everyone uh, 48 hours um, after with them. So they, these are the topics we're going to be discussing for today. I would like to read them out quickly for you. First, the challenges in the oil and gas sector in Qatar. Second, how can digital help companies overcome these challenges? Third, digital capabil capabilities companies should uh, look at developing. And four, the success stories from these industries. So as we're speaking right now, a poll will be shown on the screen. Please submit it. I'll read it out to you. So the poll says, do you think that the impact on the oil and gas market has affected the Qatar market? A, yes, very evidently, can be seen affecting the next uh, year financial year. B, yes, it has impacted, but can be managed in the next financial year. And C, simply no, no major impact. What do you think? Okay, we have a very interesting result, actually. 50% of the participants said um, A, which is yes, very evidently, and the other half said uh, B. Um, it's very interesting that it's an exactly 50-50 divide. So Gopal, please let us know what you think. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gopal Balsarubhaniam, as uh, Layan uh, introduced. Uh, I'm the head of audit and the head of oil and gas for uh, Qatar, and I used to had the oil and gas sector for the Middle East and South Asia for the last eight years. Uh, most of uh, you in the participants uh, list know me well, so I don't want to introduce myself. Uh, also, we have an elite panel, and uh, I know uh, they're all they're all subject matter experts on this uh, digital transformation journey, which we are going to talk about. As Lian said, uh, I have my fellow partner, uh, um, and Nizar Hani, as well as uh, the manager, Monica Sandhu, and uh, they are from Qatar Practice, and Mazar, uh, from UK is a champion on uh, a digital transformation, working with super majors on large transformation projects. So he's also there. So as I said, I am not a subject matter expert on digital, but uh, having worked on the hydrocarbon sector for the last 25 years in this market, uh, largely working with uh, QP, Qatar Gas, and almost every single uh, uh, QP entity in Qatar. Uh, so uh, Nizar thought uh, I should probably start off with uh, you know, uh, sharing my thoughts on the overall landscape of oil and gas um, uh, sector globally, and also uh, Qatar stories, especially uh, during COVID-19, how it has impacted. 
so uh, that's my role and uh, and before i hand over to uh, nizar i will just touch base on some of the key aspects of uh, how what the uh, landscape is looking like um, as as you all know um, um, so before that i would say the digital transformation itself uh, you know the topic why we have selected this is something which is um, i would say buzzword for the last 3 4 years uh, the digital transformation across different sectors but this covid 19 pandemic has really accelerated the transformation journey for most of the sectors especially in the energy sector we have been seeing so many stories of huge investments which was supposed to happen probably 2 3 years down the road on digital transformation has been you know uh, advanced so that is that's why we thought uh, this uh, topic is really of interest to the audience here so uh, in terms of the overall landscape um, of uh, the oil and gas sector globally um, i would say for the last 4 uh, years in fact from 2015 onwards uh, 14 and onwards uh, the price has been hovering around uh, you know less than 100 uh, after a, 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 a period of about 6 to 7 years of 150 above uh, at um, after that you know if you see uh, uh, from march onwards or even from february uh, you know when uh, the lockdown started in most of the economies with no aircraft flying uh, no no cars on the road the fuel demand has really i know a uh, drop down heavily so uh, what has happened is uh, the prices uh, dropped uh, significantly in march especially because uh, in march march 9th or so then you uh, know uh, they had um, you know opec uh, uh, a meeting was there and uh, russia and opec could not agree on uh, agree on certain terms so the price dropped but um, you know that's the scene globally but in terms of qatar i know this this slide basically talks about the presence of qatar in the global hydrocarbon sector you see you know uh, we are the qatar is the third largest uh, has got the third largest gas reserves after russia and iran and uh, you know in terms of the crude uh, crude reserves 25.2 billion barrels which is about 13th in the, the world position in terms of gas they they have uh, uh, maximized their uh, gas reserves by investing wisely on lng from 1992 onwards the qatar gas first investment started uh, as early as 92 and the shipment first shipment was about 97 98 so 77 million tons that's a staggering number uh, of lng production and exports uh, way high uh, from the second one which is australia is about 42 million tons so uh, these these are some of the uh, characteristics of qatar economy which basically contributes 60% of the gdp from uh, hydrocarbon sector because of the uh, crude exports and the uh, apart from the crude you have the condensates and other ngls we see on the second uh, the right hand side of the slide you have 1.9 million barrels produced every day in qatar which includes cut, uh, crude and condensates and the ngl this is mainly from uh, uh, on, onshore field dukan uh, which is about 335000 barrels but predominantly offshore fields which was all under production sharing agreements for a large long quite part of the uh, you know uh, tenure of hydrocarbon uh, you know history in qatar but uh, off late you know if you see most i you know the production sharing contract huge oil field uh, uh, they were operating al shaheen uh, the production sharing contract uh, completed the tenure got over then it was set up as a joint venture that is the trend which we are facing in qatar where the uh, on the expiry of production sharing contracts either the uh, the uh, joint ventures are getting formed or the operation is taken over by qp just in case of oxy which has happened recently so this is the, in, in a nutshell how qatar is positioned in terms of uh, the overall uh, gas production and the uh, crude reserves uh, in terms of um, uh, opec war um, if you can move to the next slide please yeah i just touched base on the opec price war how the prices dropped down significantly uh, from march onwards on uh, april 12th they all met uh, with russia again they agreed on a, a, a production cut of about 7.7 million barrels per day the overall production of crude the world production is about <clears throat> 95 million barrels out of that 7.7 million no 9.7 million barrels per day they agreed to cut for may and june so that you uh, know the inventories which are largely getting accumulated in the uh, crude producing countries can be managed um, and uh, again uh, you know it was not helping further and they met in july to continue the reduction up to december the product production cut will be about 7.7 million barrels per day from the uh, producing countries so this is mainly helping a little bit on uh, you know on the overall uh, price war and uh, if you see the latest prices is much better than what it was in march and uh, april in fact in uh, may it went to negative in us um, largely because of the uh, futures uh, trading so uh, uh, prices stabilizing but still it's a volatile zone which we are looking at Uh, we have to still wait and watch how things uh, are going to shape up when 
uh, you know, the economy is op open up and uh, whether there's going to be further lockdowns and uh, further demand contraction. Um, in terms of um, uh, Qatar, as I said, uh, LNG uh, is the main uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, contributor to the economy with <clears throat> 77 million tons exported, and most of them are on long-term SPAs, you know, where um, you know, the contracted com commodity is already uh, there with uh, uh, players like uh, Chibu Electric in Japan, you have Kogas in Korea, India, Petronet, um, and, uh, Taiwan, CPC in Taiwan. There are large quantities of LNG already co contracted to be sold over a long-term period, which is about 25 years, and the prices are indexed with the oil indices. And so, uh, yes, the prices do have dropped down, but not uh, immediately. So uh, at least the uh, commodity is already sold. There are, uh, uh, these are the contracts which, are, which have been signed over the last uh, uh, 20 years period uh, since LNG investment happened. But having said that, there's been a large demand contraction since most of the produce, produce is going to Asian economies. Uh, Asian economies are, uh, you know, reeling under pressure. If you see Japan, there's a drop of 28% uh, in the uh, demand for oil and gas. India has got 11% drop. These are all large customers of Qatar. So even though the, you know, uh, the commodity is being lifted, there's a reschedulement and the price also probably will come under negotiation. So these are some of the things which are, um, you know, the Qatar specific stories uh, because your 90% of uh, total exports is from hydrocarbon sector. And uh, LNG, uh, you know, there's going to be a drop of 4% year on year uh, on the total demand uh, from uh, arising out of uh, COVID-19. So this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is what I would like to share in terms of price war on demand contraction. So Gopal, if I, if I may interrupt. Um, as you are aware, recently there have been a lot of new gas field discoveries in the Mediterranean region. And what are your views on the impact this has uh, on the oil and gas industry in Qatar? Yeah. That's a good question, uh, Leam. Um, what, what has happened is, uh, yes, there have been a lot of discoveries uh, you know, of late, and also there are other countries who have, uh, who have started investing on LNG. But Qatar's advantage has been, as always been saying that they were one of the first ones to enter. You know, as I said, 1992, the first uh, uh, the Qatar gas entity was formed, then Ras gas was formed. Now it's only one entity, Qatar gas. But uh, the first shipment happened in 97, 98, and uh, all these trains, 14 trains, they built up. 14 trains up to 2007 and uh, 77 million capacity and 85% of that has, has been sold under long-term SPAs. So it's very difficult for the new players to sign up for such a long-term uh, contracts in this current scenario. And more than that, uh, the cost of production in Qatar is very, very less. It's the third cheapest uh, overall. So that's one of the uh, advantages because uh, unlike Russia and Iran, even in other countries, in Qatar gas is all centered around one field called North Field. The, uh, you know, this was single largest gas discovery in the world. So that has really helped them because the bar pressure is high. They don't have to really invest a huge lot to get the uh, hydrocarbons out of here. So that's one of the advantages. So yes, the discoveries are coming. It's going to be a long drawn journey for most of the others because Qatar was one of the first ones to get in and they're still continuing investing. In fact, uh, you know, they're going to be, um, you know, uh, going on a north field expansion project producing another 48 million tons uh, out of six trains to in two phases, phase one, four trains, and phase two, two trains. So all these mega trains I know, will continue. The minister has announced uh, that there won't be any deferral on these projects. It will all go on stream. So there's more LNG coming in from Qatar into the world market. And I think that there's, there's a significant advantage for Qatar based on the factors which is said, and they are still continuing to invest on LNG carriers. Nakilat is the uh, the longest, uh, you know, the largest LNG carrier in the world, already owning about 60 vessels, either uh, wholly owned or through joint ventures. But QP is investing again in China and Korea on increasing the LNG fleet. So these are some of the you know factors which uh, I would say Qatar is in much uh, I would say different zone when compared to other um, uh, oil producers. And um, you know even the geopolitical env uh, environment there have been disturbances. Um, uh, we have to wait and watch how how, how long will these uh, disturbances uh, will impact the overall hydrocarbon sector. My take before I hand over to uh, uh, my uh, subject matter experts on uh, on Qatar is one is I know it's a journey from uh, of an NOC becoming an IOC, you know, national oil company turning into an international oil company with operations in US, UK, Canada, Argentina, uh, you know, uh, Italy, uh, 
uh, Egypt, can I know there are so many countries they have invested on. They are continuing to invest, as you can see uh, in the last point. They have uh, again invested on a few other blocks. So uh, it's a it's a complete journey of uh, uh, of QP, which uh, which they, they will uh, is adaptable to. They are adaptable to the changing conditions as well. As I said, production sharing contracts being converted to TV arrangements. There are so many things which they are doing in the right way, which will only help them in making sure that they stay ahead of the competition. So in terms of uh, the subject, the IT enablement, if you start with, and uh, so IT enablement is, uh, is something which we started uh, uh, in 1999. So Qatar e-government was one of the first uh, I know initiatives, uh, you know, in fact, uh, Qatar was one of the first countries to embark on e-government. But in terms of digitalization, there's a lot of initiatives from uh, Ministry of um, uh, no, Transportation and Communication, MOTC, Tasmu Qatar project, the Smart Qatar project, QDB has come out with a uh, you know, FinTech uh, in launch. There's so many things happening in Qatar on the digitalization and also in the hydrocarbon sector, which we will probably hear from uh, the experts and I will join you later uh, for Qatar specific stories on digitalization. Over to you, Layan. Thank you. Thank you, Gopal, for talking about the energy sector itself. And now I would like to start to talk to us and help us understand how digital uh, can help the oil and gas sector overcome all of these challenges. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you. And uh, I'm very happy to, to be here at this webinar to talk about a very important topic. Digital transformation for, for sure is a passion for me, but uh, uh, to talk about it in relation to the oil and gas and after uh, great insights we heard from uh, our colleague Gopal, who has uh, accompanied this, this industry here in Qatar and in the region for, for, for a while and really knows the inside uh, out of that, it, 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 uh, it makes us uh, uh, have to stand up to the to the to the occasion and really see if digital c could help. And I'm, I'm, I don't want to spoil the story, but but yes, uh, it does. Uh, you're looking at at uh, some of the research we've done in the last quarter. Maybe some of you have have heard about it. But KPMG was looking at the different sectors and the impact of COVID-19. Of course, we cannot discuss. Uh, anything uh, recently if we don't bring COVID-19 into, into the discussion. COVID-19 has affected our lives tremendously. And if you look at the different economic sectors, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through them all, but I would like to uh, turn your attention to the top left corner, where we see uh, the energy uh, players. Unfortunately, uh, we, we, would, we would think that uh, the, the type of impact COVID-19 uh, will have on those industries, and we start to see it, is not going to be uh, short term. It's going to be lasting impact, and uh, them coming back will 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 take will take a while. Uh, on that note, I'd like also to highlight one thing about COVID-19. Uh, a lot of the impact of COVID-19 has been uh, as an accelerator. So. The energy sector was witnessing impact of some of the new habits. We have uh, the push for, for clean energy, uh, uh, the, the, the trend of, of uh, the shifting demand more from the west to the east, uh, the, the trend in, in the new, new generation millennials to go for, for sharing economy and uh, and. Uh, for sure, the, 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 the younger uh, ones on the webinar see that, for example, the, the, the urge to have a car for, for a newer generation is not as it is, uh, for example, for, for, for my generation. So all of those uh, trends that started post COVID are, has, have been accelerated uh, by the COVID-19, and that has impacted the uh, industry. Now, to, to come to the point of digital, and as we will see on the on the on the uh, on the next slide, uh, uh, we put here the the the, uh, the the title: How would the digital support transformation? And does it go beyond technology? It it is for sure digital. For us, is is not about the technology itself uh, or the or the or the uh, IT solutions. It has to start from the business impact, and this is why it was important to start our webinar today side and hear about 
the oil and gas and what what uh, challenges they're facing. And as Gopal was saying, there is uh, uh, a huge on the on the prices so uh, the topic of of uh, growing which is a main usual goal of 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 of, uh, of going digital uh, takes takes uh, a lot of importance because uh, the uh, the oil and gas the energy companies in general need to seek those pockets of growth. where are they how are they and by using technologies they can leverage uh, they can have leverage to shift uh, their uh, their uh, uh, the revenue streams to those pockets uh, of growth. Of course, when you have a huge uh, pressure on your revenues, you need to have a, uh, a, an efficient uh, cost structure and you need to improve your productivity. And that's again where, from a digital perspective, you need to look specifically at your business, how you can make it more productive. It, it's not about bringing uh, uh, RPA or talking about analytics and then seeing, uh, like putting a lot of investment and seeing what you can do with it. It's the other way around. You need to be productive. You need to benchmark, see where you can improve your productivity, and then see what type of technology would help you in, in reaching that goal. Market positioning, again, uh, which which uh, which uh, market uh, niches or segments are you good at? You can leverage, improve there. All of those, uh, all of such information you can receive based on analytics, but you need to know what you're looking for and configure your systems accordingly. Of course, innovation, maybe a lot of people say uh, digital uh, or, or oil and gas, uh, it's not going to be, uh, uh, the digital information is not going to be uh, revolutionary, it's more uh, evolutionary in both cases you need to open up for an innovation know how to onboard uh, uh, smaller players more innovative players how you can work together and and uh, and improve your your operations reach your strategies faster customer engagement this is applicable from a digital perspective for for uh, b2c as well as b2b uh, we we see here uh, nowadays for example blockchain based contracts which allow uh, agreements to be to be to be done in, in no time and this is a trend that is coming and we know also that in oil and gas a lot of the players are are turning to to, to such type of contracts with other with, with their with their clients but also from a, from another perspective moving moving to the to the technologies and and, and how they could help we, we we are looking here at a simple framework that uh, talks about uh, the different technologies and how we can put them together to realize the digital goals that we spoke about. For example, when we talk about market positioning, customer en engagement, this needs to be reflected from a digital experience point of view. Do you really have the right digital channels to interact with, uh, with the clients? Do they fit the business pur purposes that you have? Are they configured properly? Moving to the, uh, to the infrastructure, uh, Cloud for sure uh, will play a big role in the future. So, uh, are 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 the oil and gas companies also here in Qatar, where we see a big push for cloud? Are they taking the right steps in that direction? Uh, another aspect of infrastructure is IoT, specifically industrial IoT. We know sensors now can be deployed everywhere. That with the support of technology, they they can do more. Their cost is less. Where to put those sensors? How to integrate them, configure them, get the right uh, the right information from them to to uh, to improve your your operations. Uh, same for for applications solutions. So th there are a lot of technologies out there, but but the right way is to start from your business goals and 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 see which ones you, you need you need to look at. And any digital strategy or a digital plan without uh, having the right cybersecurity, and when we talk about uh, the energy sector, we need to make sure that our uh, OT is linked properly to the to the to the IT. So, from operational perspective, the, the SCADAs and all the other systems are properly uh, maintained, properly uh, properly protected, because uh, an attack there or, or or not taking the right measures. Could really cost cost dearly. This is one of the major uh, major threats uh, that uh, uh, oil and gas companies are facing uh, ar around the world. An underlying layer 
lack of, of data. Data is the essence of, of digital. If you don't have data, no solution will be the right solution for you. You need to really have uh, the proper data strategy, uh, the proper data management system. You need to uh, have your data properly cleaned. You need to put the data in, 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 the, in the right structure to be, to be used by all those uh, applications and, and services. In, in the oil and gas specifically, uh, I would say, because we talked about cooperation and innovation, maybe the forums that are uh, globally present to support the industry need to look at uh, providing uh, 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 a clearer uh, uh, standards for data to support the exchange of data, which would help uh, a lot of use cases to be, to be launched to, to support the industry. The most important part is not the technology part here, and I would like to just close that for, uh, this section with it. It's about how you manage your digital projects and how you build the capabilities to utilize your technologies that you're building properly and achieve the digital goals, which are related to your business goals. I'll just give a very quick example about analytics. Everybody talks about analytics, but if you have the best uh, database decision-making schemes and they are integrated in your processes, but at the end you have a, a top management individual who who bases his decisions on 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 gut uh, on gut feeling, and he would be right back to all the experience he would have, and ignore the data, you get nowhere. You need to have the uh, right data presented at the right step for, for the decision making, and you need to have a data team who's empowered to present their case and, and ensure that uh, the right decisions are, are based on the right data they are presented uh, with. I think uh, here we could uh, I'll give back to Leanne. To maybe we can hear about more specific uh, use cases for the oil and gas industry, and also see what the top uh, top uh, managers in the, in, the, in the sector are talking about in terms of digital transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nizar, Thank for you. all of these insights. Um, so we're going to also look at uh, the second poll. And um, I'll read it out to you. So the poll says, what is the major driver in the oil and gas for being digital? A, operations optimization and customer satisfaction. B, transitioning of energy sources. C, global competition. And four, all of the above. Let us know what you think. I would say probably each company has its own use case that they push for. Yeah. Okay, the results are um, are different actually. So 20% 20, 20 of our audience said uh, operations optimization. Um, B, which was transitioning of energy sources, only 7% of our participants uh, chose that. 20% said global uh, competition, and 47% said all of the above. Uh, Mazhar, would you like to tell us know what you think? Sure, thank you. So, uh, I, 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 I think uh, I would have personally also selected all of the above. I think uh, uh, one of the things from my perspective, specifically based on my experiences, um, and we've talked a lot about COVID, and don't want to spend too much time on COVID, but pre COVID, um, the, the, the set of really under a huge amount of pressure um, that was a, a pre COVID and pre kind of the Sorry, I think yeah you your 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 voice is not is not very clear. I know you're uh, you're connecting from the UK so uh, there was a bit of an echo and then uh, blur in the voice. Okay, so let me just um so can I just check that you can hear me okay. Yeah, maybe maybe you can reconnect again, and and meanwhile I could uh, just talk about the, the, our understanding of the connected enterprise. Then if you can reconnect uh, to tell us about the, the, the trends uh, that you wanted to to explain. So waiting for Mazhar, I, I wanted to quickly uh, touch on a, on, a, on a framework we think could help 
in the oil uh, and gas uh, industry or also monica if you if you can uh, present some of the use cases and then mazhar mazhar can uh, can fill us in about that the the ceo survey when one is back Nazar, thank you very much so now let me just talk specifically about the oil and gas industry and how we've seen digital come into play in this industry so this is basically something that we break down into three areas which would be your front end back end and the middle office so on your front end would be your customers your customer satisfaction back end your operations and hr and finance is something that's used across different industries not specific to oil and gas only so let me start about where all we've used this for customer satisfaction. Say we've used it for field production forecasting, for portfolio optimization based on this, upstream data management and data quality control, market risk management. HR and finance, we use it in scenarios like we automate HR processes, we do automated invoice matching, et cetera, but we'll not touch on that. We'll just stick to the oil and gas specific sectors. For operations, you can look upon IoT and digital twins, predictive maintenance, cybersecurity, resource optimization, and asset maintenance and performance. So now to give you more insights on some of these, let me just do like a deep dive on those, um, referring to the previous slide, actually. Like, uh, let's talk about field production forecasting. Now, this is something that has been happening in the oil and gas industry since the very beginning. There used to be a more traditional approach that we used to take to this, and now it's more digital oriented. But when we do that, what happens is there's a real-time integration between your manufacturing and the sales based on your actual data. In traditional forecasting, you could never really deliver precision, which ultimately led to shortfalls, gave rise to new business challenges, because past records alone can never predict and represent the future of any organization. Without smart technologies found in modern, intelligent ERP systems, aging equipment, changing technologies, maintenance practices, and other modifications in the manufacturing se sector, forecasting cannot be predicted beforehand. Now, using smart technologies, we can enable sophisticated analysis as well with statistical calculations, which are all based on your real-time data and are all automated. The assumptions no longer have to be broad and generic. They can be more case-to-case -case basis, more real-time. The other thing we can look upon is the upstream data management and data quality. Now, data is the backbone for anything that when it comes to going digital. It's something that you need to control, you need to organize, and it's something we need to leverage for all our analytics and any other, any other analysis that we need to do on it, on our operations. So to do this, we can, like companies can do the following steps. They can define data management strategy and implementation blueprint, which will be aligned with your business strategy. So your business goals are fulfilled using your digital tools. You can shortlist processes and operational parameters for functional excellence based on the areas that you want to highlight, any things that you want to optimize, you want to excel in certain areas for that. We can establish a data loading process based on products, applications, and workflows. We can transform and enrich data for business decisions, which is basically the only reason why we do data analytics so that we can analyze this data using business intelligence, data federation, data warehousing, et cetera. Let me give you one more example from uh, the operations perspective. It can be IoT and digital twins. Now, to emphasize more on what digital twins are, it's basically a virtual model where you're pairing the virtual as well as the physical world. So whatever is happening in your physical world is something you mimic in your virtual world and use analytics on the data based on it and make better decisions using it. This can be used for system monitoring, for analyzing data, to improve operations, prevent downtime, reduce maintenance costs, and provide data that can be used to streamline operations. To emphasize more on this, there are four scenarios that we can look at where, uh, which gives you a more real life situation of how it's been done. So in the next slide, as you can see, 
you can use data as well as your digital practices for say physical monitoring. So the current challenge is that in the oil and gas industry, there's so many sites, right? People to monitor your equipment as well as your assets, there is labor that you employ, which goes from site to site to do this activity. Now this involves incurring labor costs, human error, et cetera. To overcome this, what companies can do is they can implement wireless IoT, which can help in monitoring the equipment and environment through sensor level technology. The same thing that Nazar was mentioning some time ago, sensors have been a very critical part of the oil and gas industry that a lot of companies can leverage. What they can do is they can monitor the equipment for failures, for erosion, temperature, pressure, perform analytics on it and make it better optimized. In lines of this, there is something called preventive maintenance, which a lot of plants do. So currently, it's been done in the traditional manner and with geographically distributed uh, sites over those. But while implementing data prediction platform to the sensor data and the equipment, this can be performed in a more efficient manner. And it can help analyze the data, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to predict the equipment failures and support the company to do proper preventive maintenance. There is one more aspect where we, we have seen use cases in the oil and gas industry, which is your supply chain optimization, which as you can see has been a part of one of the major drivers in going digital. Now in this, we can touch upon one thing, say inventory planning. Now inventory planning is a very critical part of the oil and gas industry because there's so many parties which are involved. Now how we can optimize this is we can implement IoT and analytics which can help us in planning and scheduling procurement and optimizing the material consumption. So data is more readily available. You have access to more real-time data. You can use it for your analytics and to make better decisions regarding how to plan better for the upcoming times. Like say COVID happened recently and we have seen some fluctuations in the market. So if you are using say real-time data for that, it's something that, that will help you put, put into motion your uh, new steps faster than before. Now, QHSC is also something that the oil and gas industry is uh, very particular about. So there's a lot of attention that's paid to safety and environment issues, and accordingly, their policies and procedures which are designed to, at all levels of operations. So there are risks which happen and there are certain actions which need to be taken. So how digital can come in here is that they can help implement data prediction platform to collect data from different sources, analyze it, reduce any anomalies which can be detected, and real-time analysis of all of this and a proper response and decision-making process can be come into place to mitigate these risks. Now, if we look at the next slide, this is how companies can bring this in as a real practical function. So these are the following steps which we recommend for any company to follow to start going digital. Now, this being digital and making digital a priority is something that has to trickle down from the top management. So it's something that starts from your senior executive. It has to be inbuilt your with your core values of the company. It's something that has to trickle down to your other employees which will help drive a culture of innovation and technology. Based on once we have this idea set into motion, we can invest in human capital and development programs that can promote new and digital thinking. Based on this, we can put in progress a, methodolo a methodical approach for developing and industrializing new capabilities, see what all are the aspects that we need to improve on, which are the aspects that we find doing it the traditional way and prioritize based on it. And one very important part is to reform your company's data architecture, which is the backbone of all your digital decision-making processes. So your data architecture is something that needs to be established in order for digital to come into play and put it into better motion. So, so just on, on this, Monica, sorry, this is Manuel. Uh, yes. I, I, just, I was going to say, yeah. say, from my perspective, seeing what I'm seeing in kind of uh, IOCs where I've been working over the last few years, um, uh, whilst the human capital piece you, you, we've put in the middle here, it's actually a massive part 
of, of the transformation. But, but the big challenge at the moment is, and to the last point earlier, that, that it's not about the technology, it, it's about the business processes and the business users. And, uh, and we're finding increasingly that, that there's a big effort that needs to go on around coaching and training um, functional leaders, people that understand the business in, in its core, in its uh, HR functions, finance functions, but also the operations functions in, in the oil and gas industry, to, to understand how they can use technology at the intersection of what they do day to day. So I can't emphasize enough that that, that, that middle piece. Um, in fact, I've got, I, we may run out of time, but there is a use case where I, I've actually been spending a lot of time with a NOC in, in KSA's uh, region, uh, just for physically focusing our time just on upskilling the finance and the treasury and the controlling t controllers team in, in digital. So, sorry to interrupt your flow there, Monica. No, no worries, Mazar. Actually, it's it's perfect that you were able to share an example where we've done this for different times. So now, if you can help us so emphasize more on any other case studies which you would have seen where the copper market can leverage from, something that we've seen with other clients or globally that uh, the market here can take some learnings from. Cool. Thanks, Monica. So, um, uh, audience, I apologize. Uh, I'm based out in the UK, and COVID has had a big impact on our infrastructure in the UK. So my, my Wi-Fi has been terrible at home since then we've been working at home and uh, I've now turned my video off just ho hoping that, that that won't distort. So I apologize for dropping off. Um, the point I was trying to make is um, pre-COVID and pre-oil price crash, actually because the, the, the price of oil was healthy, there was never a, a, an urgency on the sector to, to, to look for efficiencies in the way that it is required now because um, you know, uh, the, the oil price drop, uh, obviously it's starting to, to kind of bottom out now, bounce back, but, uh, but also with regards to COVID, you know, that both those things um, uh, have driven the urgency. Uh, and it's interesting, actually, I, I read a fact recently uh, from Satya Nadella, CEO for Microsoft, and he said, we've achieved um, more in two months through COVID than we, uh, in terms of a digital transformation than we would have in two years. Uh, and and what, that, what he meant by that is you, you, one of the biggest challenges pre-COVID uh, in transformation, and Nazar, I mean, I interested in your comments on this as well in the region, um, it wasn't about the investment in technology or, or the buy-in from the leadership. It was actually the, the culture and the change uh, and the education in the business to, to really start driving that change uh, top down uh, and, and then bottom up within the organization. So, you know, what COVID has done is it's forced that on us all, right? So, so um, just briefly, uh, we ran a CEO survey, and, and actually what we found is uh, CEOs are looking at organizations um, or their organization very differently post-COVID, uh, and they're really looking, uh, you know, in the excess of 75% of CEOs are looking at uh, digital as a means to drive innovation within organizations. But whilst they are looking at innovation in a big way and driving new business models and new ways of working, they are also looking very hard at their core operations. So to Monica's point earlier, you know, what are the core parts of your business that you can optimize and drive more efficiency and, 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 and more uh, kind of cost out to be able to run more lean uh, and then be able to redirect the same into uh, new innovative endeavors uh, for revenue. So the team just and are looking at a case study on this one very easily given the time that we have on the case study. Uh, ultimate challenge for our audience. Uh, we're having an issue with the voice, with the voice again. I don't know why why digital is failing us today between UK, UK and, and Qatar. Hello, Maz, can you hear us? I can hear you, sir. I can hear you, okay. Yeah, unfortunately, the, the the voice the voice is is not is not supporting. I mean, uh, we really wanted to hear more about about the cases and, and about the insights that you were talk, talking about from the uh, oil and gas CEO outlook. But also for the sake of time, we have still ten minutes. We, we there are a couple of questions uh, we we would like to answer. Uh, so, Layan, if you even. Uh, we, we 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 didn't have uh, time for the poll. Let's let's have the Q and A to answer a couple of questions, and for sure we'll not be able to answer all of the questions. But uh, as Leon promised at the beginning, uh, we will we will uh, answer each question per email 
or by getting back to the person who, who posted it. So to you, Leanne, to, to, to ask the question. Thank you, and thanks to everyone uh, for all of these insights. So my first question is, uh, after QP's recent decision to capital and operational costs, how do you see the Qatar market coping with the revenue pressure? I think, I think we, we need to follow for that. Yeah, sure. Um, see, as I mentioned, uh, no, at least in the hydrocarbon sector, uh, yes, there is a, you know, a, a drop in the prices, which is affecting the overall cash inflows. But uh, we see uh, both crude and uh, the LNG produce is all long-term contracts. The co com commit committed quantities are being still, uh, you know, taken by all these, uh, you know, customers who all signed up a uh, contract for, uh, you know, long-term uh, of, of say 25 years. So, so there are still cash flows coming in. Yes, there is a, a dip in the cash inflows. But still, I would say Qatar is in a much advantageous position because of uh, you know uh, getting in early, signing up all these long-term contracts, and um, you know able to get in uh, generate enough cash inflows. So while uh, the operation cost and uh, uh, the cut in capital and operating cost by 30% is going to help in the overall uh, net cash inflows, even on the top line, I would say you know the uh, price is again bouncing back, and um, you know uh, we have to be bullish. You know I think uh, next one year. Um, we, I, I personally see, um, you know, uh, Qatar standing tall because of, uh, you know, all these uh, positives they had in the hydrocarbon sector. Not just on the upstream, even on the uh, downstream side. You know, a lot of investments have happened, whether it's uh, uh, polyethylene or fertilizers or aluminium, steel, and all these things are able to bring in, uh, even though at reduced prices, but still uh, cash flows are coming in. So I would say, you know, they should be able to manage it uh, over a period of one year. Uh, this uh, cash crunch. Thank you, Gopal. I'll go for the next question. Um, what are the major challenges for the oil and gas industry when it comes to digital transformation? I would like uh, to take to take that one. Actually, we would like also to have heard from from us, but because of the connection. Uh, it won't work. So, uh, in, in general, we, we talked a bit about 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 the challenges, especially what Maz was, was talking about uh, when we were hearing him. Uh, the, 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 it's not only relevant to oil and gas, but in general, digital transformation without building the right capabilities is 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 a major issue because your uh, first when you don't have the right capabilities, the projects themselves get uh, delayed. There's a lot of frustration, which leads to disbelief in the technology itself. And after the project is somehow closed, the rate of adoption is, is not high. I mean, I can tell you from, from ERP projects that are going on and with all the, 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 the investment that goes there, probably less than 40% of the capabilities an, an ERP system can provide is being used, and that's across industries. Another, another major challenge that I see at the moment, this is also relevant uh, in our region and for, and for Qatar, uh, with, the, with, the, with the pressure on the revenues and all the initiatives to cut the cost, uh, it is a big challenge for the management to pick the right digital investment so we are facing a bit of a chicken and an egg situation. You need to invest, especially in digital technologies, to improve your operations, to be more productive, to be more efficient, and to be able to, uh, to, to stand up with, to, to all the challenges facing you. But at the same time, you're cutting the cost, so you cannot make a lot of investments in digital. And this is going to be a real uh, advantage that, that the players who know how to use this challenge to go for uh, targeted pilots, uh, collaboration models, uh, open up their value chain to other players to, 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 to work with them at a relatively reduced cost, but still foster innovation and come up with new ideas. Those, the ones who can master that will have a big advantage uh, in, the, in the coming years. Thank you, Nizar. Thank you. Uh, so, so now we're gonna we're gonna look at uh, the following question, which uh, which says, based on your experience of dealing with QP, Qatar Gas, and other joint ventures of QP, what is the readiness of oil and gas sector in terms of scaling up on digitalization of their processes and operations? 
Um, Gopal, would you like to take a go on this? Yep, sure. sure. Um, uh, as far as the hydrocarbon sector in Qatar, as you know, QP is the, uh, the main player. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, initiatives on the uh, digital transformation side, which QP has already embarked on in the last uh, couple of years or even more, I would say, um, because uh, they, uh, they went into SAP S4, HANAM, the cloud-based solutions. Based on that, the finance uh, and uh, even in HR, there's a lot of digital uh, initiatives which have already been uh, happening and uh, some of them have been successfully rolled out. In HR, I would say a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, digital solutions have been rolled up uh, in terms of finance, which uh, Monica talked about in terms of invoice uh, validation process uh, and, and uh, things like that. I know they have already uh, been working on and uh, some of them have been implemented. Predictive maintenance is one of the areas where uh, things have been done already. Um, uh, they, they tied up with Ariba on uh, SAP, SAP Ariba for supply chain. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether they went ahead. So supply chain transformation probably an area where uh, they, they had to do more. But um, uh, to answer your question, yes, things are being done at QP level at various pockets uh, uh, in terms of uh, digitalization and the journey will continue. Um, and the digital oil fields is one area probably uh, they, they're seriously looking at and uh, they will invest more uh, you know, going forward. And um, you know they'll, uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll catch up on, uh, you know, uh, on digital transformation journey. Thank you. Thank you, Gopal. So I think we can entertain one more question. Um, so the last question says, cyber risks will increase with more digitalization. What are the steps companies are taking to mitigate these? Um, actually, Anne, if you don't mind, I, I would like to take that one. So cybersecurity is something that is very relevant in today's market. The government is pushing a lot towards it. A lot of companies have already started implementing it. A lot of companies are in the process of implementing it. Now, there are certain steps that any company can take in order to make sure that it's safe and cyber protected. Now, those steps can be, they can identify and document asset vulnerabilities. They can identify and document any risk that they see both internal as well as external. Based on this, they can assess their vulnerabilities. They can identify potential business impacts and the likelihoods of the risk impacting their business. And finally, they can identify and prioritize their risk response. Now, what companies generally do is that they perform cybersecurity assessments in order to make sure that all their risks are covered. They abide by the guidelines which have been issued by the ministries and other. There are certain frameworks, certain policies in place that companies can abide by, which are already set by the government that they can leverage. So if we keep all these things in mind while going digital, then we can help cover ourselves from a lot of risks that actually inhibit us from progressing in our business. Uh, Leanne, there was one question from Salman Gulzar. It came very early in the webinar. Yes. How do you see the LNG demand with a contracting global economy? Probably I'll just quickly answer that uh, before we uh, wrap up. Uh, see, there are, um, you know, yes, uh, there has been a glut in the market in terms of uh, overall LNG uh, with the Qatar pumping in more and more, Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia. There are a lot of uh, countries which are producing more LNG. But my take on this, uh, Salman, is uh, the fossil fuels, uh, whether it's crude or LNG, you know, uh, has got its own share for the next 15, 20 years. Yes, renewables are coming up. But the scale of renewables, the rate of growth in renewables is not that as high as in uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the fossil fuels. And the demand for LNG, uh, I would say, definitely is there for the next 15, 20 years, even though there is a contracting global economy. I think this is what I would like to say as uh, you know, my response to your question. Thank, Thank you. you. And since we have another question, I think we can quickly fit it in. Uh, bridging the gap in innovative technologies around managing supplies and forecasting, price trends seem to be the need for the hour that has long-term implications. What are your views on this? How is the current progress in the industry in your experience? And how technology can be harnessed around this? Yeah, very interesting question and and, and a real trend that we might have touched upon, but we didn't go deep into because this would really need a, a webinar on its own. Leveraging uh, intelligence with the power of, of uh, of analytics and and uh, the ability to simulate really a lot of aspects of the market today and a lot of big players are doing that and we know in Qatar as well gives you the uh, a really good basis to be able to factor in most of the changes political environmental 
uh, supply chain for and with a proper engine with the right data you can come up with fairly accurate forecasts we've done that for several industries and also within oil and gas so that the, the, the technology there is maturing the, the key there is to keep a feedback loop and keep feeding new information to your algorithms to make sure that they are uh, learning and that they are uh, that the accuracy is improving uh, again capabilities human capabilities to run and build and maintain such algorithms will be key i'm really eager to to, uh, to discuss that further hopefully we can do that in a, in a second webinar thank you you are on mute Leon. oops okay hello thank you everyone and uh, we'll, we'll answer all the other questions that we couldn't entertain through email or we'll contact the person who asked directly um, thank you for thank you for attending and thanks for all the panelists